We turn now to police encounters that have turned deadly. The Colorado governor has just appointed a special prosecutor to investigate the death of 23-year-old Elijah McClain, who was stopped by police and, like George Floyd and so many others, said those chilling words. I can't breathe. In the boat. I can't breathe. The part that ravaged me the most, what he said were kind words. He was kind to the people that were killing him. A portrait of 23-year-old Elijah McClain playing his violin. It's one of the several murals New York artist Vince Ballantyne has designed since the world shut down in March. I've been constantly going, which is still a little nerve wracking. I'm not a doomsdayer, but I am cautious. But then the protests start. You just blame protesters! Hands out! Don't shoot! Hands out! Don't shoot! Everything in me was like, well, I don't want to get sick, but I need to be out there. You know, I need to be in this. This is this is this is about me right now. You've heard their names. Say her name. You know their faces. Victims of racism and police violence. Now memorialized in full color and larger than life. In the midst of a global pandemic clashing with a modern day civil rights movement. Artists across the country are using spray cans and paint rollers to match the voices of a movement with visuals, massive visuals, and they refuse to be ignored. The words Black Lives Matter painted up and down streets across towns and cities throughout the country. We've seen this kind of almost proliferation of these Black Lives Matter murals it's become kind of contagious in a certain way. This one is in downtown Manhattan. The word lives designed by local artist Sophia Dawson. What type of impact is that driving for people to be able to see art like yours having a similar message in smaller towns around the country? Until I started looking at what they did in Seattle, what they did in Harlem, I was like, oh my God, this is really uh, like, it's kind of like a domino effect, a ripple effect happening, right? I think it's, for the communities, I feel like they feel like their voices are being heard, that they're being seen for the first time. Today, we're in Newark, New Jersey, by Sophia's piece titled Every Mother, featuring 13 mothers affected by gun violence in a television-inspired mural. She painted it in the fall of 2016, after the police killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. There's basically nobody who's excluded when you're dealing with public art. What has this moment meant to you? Had this happened and there was no pandemic or quarantine, the people would not have time to be on the streets. And so the purpose of Color Bars is to really literally be the TV screen that used to say programming is done for today. And you were stuck with this background until TV came back on. And so it feels like the world has stood still in that way for the first time. You talk about these color bars, but you painted this in 2016. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you knew something was going to happen? Yeah, I, I like that the work is still relevant, but it also hurts that the work is still relevant at the same time. What is it about having art on a wall, having art so big that makes it more impactful and gets those type of reactions? Oh, God. Working big is so, like, it's so in your face. You can't miss it. You don't have to be privileged enough to have the luxury of going to a museum or going to a gallery. And so, essentially, public art, murals, it's bringing art to the people. Paintings like Sophia's follow a long history of street art that mirrors the struggles of society. Whitney Museum assistant curator Rujeko Hockley says that with a pandemic and a racial reckoning, everyone has a voice. This pandemic has really given everyone their, that sense of being their own, their own superhero. Like, we're, we're doing it. We all are doing it. I think everyone has really started to see that they have, you know, we have the answers in ourselves. And there's a lot of artists, I think, who've known that for a long time. Artists in the United States have been chronicling the now on walls for decades. Now we call it street art, but I think in the past we've had kind of different names for it. Certainly kind of one of the first things that I think of is the Mexican muralists in the 1920s, but I'm also thinking about during the HIV AIDS crisis in the United States, artists like Keith Haring, and I think they had a real impact on the public's attention to that crisis, which had been, of course, under-recognized, ignored. What is 
beautiful about art and what we're seeing today. People are appreciating it in a very different way than they have before. What we're seeing are these conversations and they're making people want to act. This is an amazing piece. Curator Jessica Goldman Srebnik, who runs the Wynwood Walls in Miami, America's mecca for murals and big art, says that this is just a sign of what's to come. We're going to have a very interesting time in the next few months with our elections. And I think you're going to see a, a very interesting amount of art that's surrounding the, the topic of making sure that you vote. I think artists today are being seen in a leadership role unlike they've ever been seen before. One of those artists looking to push the conversation into voting booths this November, Los Angeles's Tristan Eaton. Angela Davis has a beautiful history of protest and activism in uh, fighting for the freedom of black people in this country. So her story should be told and shouted from the rooftops. And we have an election coming up, so I painted vote around her with her shouting it. Back in June, Tristan made local headlines after this mural of MLK he created was defaced. I decided to paint Martin Luther King as a sign of solidarity, and uh, that was met with some blowback. My mural was tagged with racist slurs. But Tristan wasn't about to let that detract from his message. It's easier to paint a, a mural of Martin Luther King than it is Malcolm X, because Malcolm X can be a divisive figure, but I realized that the only people that find him divisive are the people I shouldn't be listening to. We said, okay, if they paint it, we'll come back and paint it again. In graffiti, you paint something, someone else paints over it, you paint right back over it again, and you kind of go to war with each other in a uh, creative battle. It turns out the disrespect is something every street artist knows. On the day of our interview with Vince, his mural had also been tagged. So what happened? A lot of times when you're doing your street art and your murals, if you leave too much space that doesn't look like it's occupied, somebody's gonna come by and say, well, there's enough room for me right here. Yeah, so what's your plan to actually cover this up? Ooh, I know now. I didn't until right this second. Right this second. Right this right second. Here. One thing that he kept saying repeatedly was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. While there's been no shortage of walls this summer, there's also been no shortage of names and faces to paint. Vince says the moment's been bittersweet. Talk to me about really what this calling has been to you as an artist and as a black man. Never in my years of living on this planet has it been advantageous to be a black painter, ever. It's kind of like I'm a commodity now. People are now like responding to my work like they never have before. As the summer comes to a close, the season of change continues. These artists continue to honor the lives lost. Most recently, an icon, the Notorious. And across the country, they're inspired to lift the voices of those who are tired and sick of being sick and tired. Transformation is on the horizon where kind of there's an awakening, where people are really awakening. It makes sense that artists are kind of at the vanguard of that because they're already attentive and attuned to the possibilities for the future. The world of graffiti is probably the largest secret society on the planet. Our collective voices are extremely powerful and we have access to the public space and I expect to see huge movement and a lot of noise from this world of people in the next few months. You call yourself a vessel every time I talk to you. And the work is supposed to minister to people. People are supposed to come in front of the painting and if they are hurting because they've lost a family member, if they are hurting because of what's happening to their community, they're supposed to be inspired, they're supposed to be uplifted. Do you feel a responsibility to be out there as this is all happening, kind of painting the story on the walls? MLK, he didn't volunteer for the job. He didn't want to say, I'm the leader of the civil rights movement. But when they came to him and said, we want you to do this, I feel the same kind of way. It was like, I didn't ask for it, but I feel like I do have a voice. So the art opened the door for this conversation.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.